Okay, <clears throat> it's now 11.02 in Brisbane. Uh, so I will go ahead and start this session. I would like to welcome you all to the Fort Bridging Transportation Researchers Conference. And as this is the first session of the conference, I would like to say a few things about the BTR conference. Uh, I believe the idea was born in 2018 when Professor Kara Kuckelman visited us at, at the University of Queensland. I know that uh, Kara and Ellie, they, they discussed the idea of starting an online conference, an online free and more importantly, an emission free platform where people from all around the world can present their work on transportation. And online conferences are now the new normal in the COVID world, but they actually organized the first BTR conference right before COVID in January, 2020. And uh, today we are starting the fourth conference of this series. Uh, before I introduce the keynote speaker today, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, after the keynote session today, there will be two parallel sessions one on shared transportation and another one on automated transportation. So this Zoom link will remain active for the shared transportation session. If you are interested in the automated transportation session, you can use the other Zoom link which is provided in the conference program. So with great pleasure today, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Agachai Sumali. Okay, so uh, Professor Sumali is one of the prominent researchers in our field uh, with great contributions in, uh, in intelligent transportation systems, uh, optimization, traffic network design, and so on. Uh, Agachai Sumali is a professor in smart city at Chulalongkorn School of Integrated Innovation, Chulalongkorn University in Thailand. Uh, before joining uh, Chulalongkorn University, he was a full professor at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University and the vice president of King Mongkut's Institute of Technology. He is a founding editor of Transport Metrica B, which is one of the most prestigious journals in our field, and he has served as an editorial board member on several journals. His research interests include intelligent transportation systems, smart cities, Internet of Things applications in smart mobility, transport technology, policy, and system optimization. Uh, he has led several successful deployments of ITS projects in Thailand, including Thailand National GPS System, Smart Bus Terminal System projects in Thailand, um, and National Smart Highway System. So based on his innovative approach to transport management, he received Aspire Prize in 2014 for the best scientist in Asia Pacific Economic Community countries. Uh, and his talk today will be about Internet of Things, data analytics and transport systems in the smart mobility area. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Sagachai. I'll stop sharing so that you can start sharing your screen. Hi, thanks a lot, um, Mehmet, for the Kai introduction. And um, uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, whichever time zone you are, to everyone who joined this conference. So it's, it's, uh, it's very nice and uh, it's very kind invitation from uh, the organizer and um, all the one involved for me to, to give a talk here. Uh, if you can let me share the, the screen, Mehmet. So what I'm gonna do today is to um, basically first to just you know recap what uh, we can envision as the future of transportation system from the perspective of data acquisition point of view and uh, overall architecture of how the data can be utilized for um, uh, offline planning and also uh, online analytics. So I think it's a very exciting time for our area, for our discipline to, to have a chance to access to very rich detail of the data. Um, and I think it's, it's very good 
timing for the all analytical work to be done given this set of data that we have right now. Can you please try to share your screen again, Agajai? Uh, I'm trying, I'm clicking the share screen, but it no? showed that the host, the host disabled. Okay. Um, I made, I made you host. Oh, okay, I got it now, I got it okay. now. Yep. Sorry. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, I think, I think I'm gonna start by um, like trying to just, you know, give some motivation of what we've been trying to do in, in transportation planning and management. Uh, I think everyone knows is the interaction between the way that we try to understand the demand side of our transportation system. So we want to understand how the traveler make decision, how the demand uh, appear from one location to another, what, you know, inside those decision-making process of the travel demand. And on the other hand, we try to manage and control uh, and to some extent optimize the supply side. And I think we, we've been trying to do this a lot from a very limited set of, of data. And um, so we, we explore a lot of science and uh, a lot of, um, you know, uh, kind of like methodology and everything just to try to uh, have a deeper or understanding or a more uh, beneficial information for us to handle the demand and the supply side in our transportation planning and management problem. So I think that's that's like the core of, of what we what we've been trying to do. And I think what changed in the past few years is that we start to have this um, what we call the level of uh, Observa uh, observable, okay. So um, in the past, if we are thinking about trying to understand the activities, the demand, uh, the management of the system, the underlying reason of some traffic or transportation problem, we normally say that it is not observable or some, to some extent is uncontrollable. So in our conventional world, uh, and then we resource to, you know, different type of survey technique and sampling data and everything. But I think now we can say with pretty much confidence that, that we are moving toward this um, style of you know, uh, system that we will have more and more components uh, that we can observe. We can have more ob observable data from uh, human activity, uh, vehicle trajectories, uh, a lot of things that previously cannot be observed. Now we can start to uh, postulate that we can get more and more detail of this observable data. And I think that 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 come from this type of um, uh, communication advancement and all this uh, technology that you know frame as the term Internet of Things or IoT. So basically you have a lot of sensor device and uh, tracking data uh, that can store and transmit the data back to uh, the central system. And, and that gives give us this opportunity to explore the rich data that we, we probably never done or never have before. And I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, a type of you know, data that uh, like 1% sampling, 10% sampling, even 20% sampling. We, we, we even talk with the case that imagine that we have all the elements of our transportation system under observation, okay? And when I say under observation, we are talking about the situation that the observation can occur continuously, okay, which a really detailed uh, resolution, uh, both in terms of uh, spatial and uh, temporal dimensions. So I think that, that, that provides us with a new challenge, but also with a new opportunity, okay, in, in, in terms of our discipline, in terms of our transportation data analytics and also the modeling uh, as, as a discipline. And then the, the next stage of this revolution, I guess, and I think we all see it happening, is that we're gonna try to manage or even control uh, our transportation system uh, more and more with a more precise uh, control parameters with a more uh, efficient uh, reaction or uh, mechanism that we can coordinate our system better because now, uh, imagine that we understand more about travel behavior and uh, 
vehicle tra trajectory movement and everything, then I think we should be able to come up with the policy to control our system in the most system optimum way. Okay, so that's that's like a general uh, view of what's going on in in I think in the past few decades in in our discipline. And again, I think it's it's uh, it's not like brand new story right now that I think everyone probably agree that we now uh, come up with the question of, we have a data, we have a lot of data. And uh, the question we normally have in mind is what we're gonna do with this data and how we're gonna utilize them uh, in such a way that we can uh, provide a much better detailed understanding of our transport and uh, how to manage them, okay? So the, the landscape of, of our transition system will be the interaction between this the physical layer of what we normally uh, have. Uh, and also now we start to have more sensing data and that create what we call the cyber layer in terms of the representation of each vehicle, each individual uh, with the detail of their location and movement and time. So I think the question is when we put this together, um, what is the framework uh, in terms of the analysis and how we use this data. So then I, I normally go back to just a typical purpose of uh, transportation planning and also transportation engineering. We would like to be able to manage things so that it you know, improve the situation uh, in front of you, what we call like a, you know, online management or day-to-day -day operation. But at the same time, we also will be interested to uh, figure out how to make things better for the long run, okay? So like a policy making type of, of, of uh, idea. So from, from the big data concept that we got, and when I say big data, it's, it's, nice, it's like a cash phrase, but it basically means you have a lot of movement data, you have a lot of activity detail data from individuals, from vehicle in your system. We can say that there will be two parallel type of uh, application uh, from this. One is on the online type of operation, more like a real-time uh, analysis and planning. And one is more on trying to understand the bigger picture and the more temporal longer term trend of things that review the underlying demand and the pattern of, of our transportation demand and supply situation. So within each of this, um, we're gonna have a lot of technical detail that I think um, we need to handle from both academic point of view and the practical point of view. Um, my talk today is, is probably gonna move very quickly from the academic concept into the practical, practical concept on how the thing can be implemented. So when we, when we mention the, the term data, um, immediately what, what comes to our, our mind is that the data is, is not quite ready to use most of the time. So definitely we need some form of like a data cleaning and the data sort of aggregation process in this part over here, okay? And I think within that, there will be a lot of question about the computational level of the data. So sometimes we need uh, data compression. And then when we have a lot of private data uh, level of personal security, and all, the, all this will be also a key element that involved in this, in this part here. And then on this short term and uh, more online part of data analytics, what, what, what we need here is something that can compute on the real time. Uh, we may not have such a detail or long-term projection into the future, but maybe more like a short term real time forecasting. And we may have to look at a quick way to recognize the data correlation among different elements of our transportation data set. And that can then go feed into this different type of operation like a personal mobility service and day-to-day -day transportation operation. And on the other side, from the same set of data, okay? So what I'm trying to, 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 to illustrate here is that we are, think, we are seeing this as an architecture which you know, there is no more different type of data for uh, real-time operation or for long-term planning. You know, there is no more situation that we need to have different data sets for different purpose. So with the same data set, uh, we also can apply uh, some type of long-term data analytics so that we can understand uh, a bigger picture of how the transportation demand 
and how the supply operates, and then can come up with uh, a kind of strategic policy making decision. So I think this is this is like a this is what, what I can observe from what's going on and also what's already been done. I think this is a framework that one set of data that we're gonna get from this sensing network, um, from the uh, GNSS system, from mobile system, 5G, 6G system. Um, now we have the multi-purpose of the way we utilize this data, okay? So on, on one hand, the data will be useful for the real-time operation. On the other hand, it will also be very beneficial for a long-term analytics to understand more long-term pattern of the demand and supply in our translation network. And then within each of these, there'll be a lot of uh, research questions and what we need to figure out how to make the data to become really useful. And I think um, what I'm trying to illustrate to the audience there is with, with that concept in mind, um, when you try to build uh, such a large scale and um, you know implementation of what I'm trying to uh, show here is that from the same set of IoT or the type of big data framework, uh, we can do both real time or monitoring real time management of the transition system, but at the same time we we should be able to start to look at the long term analytics to see the more uh, detailed pattern okay or underlying behavior of the demand. And, uh, and how things actually change in the transition network in the long run. And the, the two examples I would present in, in this talk is uh, the first one is uh, as the um, introduction uh, of myself is that um, we have a chance to implement uh, the national GPS uh, based vehicle uh, monitoring system in Thailand. And that's already been around for almost five years. So I'll give you some uh, detail on what, what involved in that um, system and then what type of data are available for us. And then within that, of course, we implement the, the real-time management of the vehicles. Uh, but on top of that, we, we implement what we call the data analytic framework. So that the data that used for the real-time uh, monitoring, real-time management of the vehicle can be at the same time become useful for the policy and planning purpose. And the second example I'm gonna present to you to illustrate those framework is uh, the demand pattern analytics from the mobile phone data. So what happened is that the GPS uh, based vehicle monitoring framework that I explained only cover uh, one portion of the demand in the transportation network, which is the freight and the public transit vehicle. But the other side, which is a private movement of the travelers, uh, that's not within this uh, GPS based system. So this is where we come up with another subsystem to fill in those uh, demand pattern analytics, but we use the personal mobile phone data. Again, both of these projects are, are, are the practical and already implemented project in Thailand and being yeah, used in the operation and planning system. So I think that will give us some uh, more like a forward looking of what possible in, in, in terms of bringing in uh, our research and idea into the implementation of, of this of this topic. Okay, so let's let's start with this uh, first um, case study, first example. And um, uh, I, I'm gonna refer a lot to, to the case study in, in Thailand because I, I was have very heavily involved in, in the design and implementation of this system. Uh, back about like uh, 2000, sorry, 2014 or 2013, I think at that time, uh, we in Thailand have, have, have a lot of serious uh, safety issue, uh, have very severe uh, case of the accident involved uh, transit vehicles. Um, you know, like this, this, this is a, like example of the intercity coach in Thailand. And also this is a type of the minivan service in Thailand. So there's a lot of serious case and injury and accident happened because of the, um, uh, you know, this lack of control and the lack of enforcement and whatever reason that, that underpin this type of accident in, in, in our national highway. Uh, not only the transit vehicle, but the heavy goods vehicle, uh, HGV, uh, there's a lot of problem as well with, with them in terms of management and control. And then I think a lot of policy has been sort of trying to, to be implemented in terms of safety policy. 
but eventually in 2015, um, we proposed the, this concept of nationwide GPS on board as the mandatory uh, device, okay, for all the um, uh, HGV, heavy goods vehicle, uh, or what we call the trucks in, in our system, and all the public transport vehicles that um, have to provide a service both in, in, in the city and also uh, at the intercity level. So this become proposed to the, the, to the parliament and to the um, uh, cabinet, government cabinet, and got approved actually, because it's a very severe case in terms of traffic accident during those period. And, and, and it's become mandatory, it's become uh, legal enforcement that all the vehicles uh, in the past and also the new vehicle that come on board from 2015 onwards have to be equipped with um, GPS or similar type of device that can track the vehicles, track the speed and also the hour of work. And uh, that's already been, uh, policy has been in place since then. And from 2015 until now, I think is about seven years. Uh, so the implementation happened like a gradual uh, deployment of the device. So at the moment, the, the half of the millions of vehicles, uh, which are the HGV vehicle and all the public transport vehicle in Thailand, they are all equipped with the GPS onboard device, okay? The difference between the commercial, typical commercial GPS and all the, you know, typical uh, system that we normally already know that the logistic company, you know, install the GPS to their vehicle anyway for their management and control is that this national GPS uh, uh, center require all the vehicles to send the data or the GPS on board back to the our back end system um, every one minute. Okay, so it means that all the vehicle, this half million vehicle, uh, which is the hundred percent of the population basically, of the heavy goods vehicle and also the public transport vehicle, send the data back to the central system for every one minute. So the data include the timestamp, okay, and the unit ID of those devices. And uh, of course, the latitude, longitude, and also the speed. Okay, There's, there are the type of detail of the data that I think typical GPS device uh, have, and but this is uh, the, 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 the crucial data that the system received every one minute. Okay, and, and since 2015 until now, then the data have piling up, you know, every one minute of this population of the vehicles. Okay, so so basically, um, I think this 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 originated from the need to improve the safety, basically. And I think what what I meant is that technology is there. Okay, technology is there, and uh, of course, at that time, everyone so like both you know against and support the idea. But from our perspective, as uh, you know, um, transportation planning and whatever we say, hey, this is this is probably one of the drastic way to immediately uh, curb down the, the, the traffic accident, uh, serious uh, accident from the type of the vehicles that we, we, we have in, in Thailand. And, and in that process, uh, I immediately uh, use this framework that we are thinking to implement like a, a standardized in terms of the data and communication control of the data. And also because the system is what we call like, you know, man, Monthly device system. So a lot of provider of this GPS device in the market, and they all have to comply with the same standard for the data and communication system. And the the in the early stage, basically the main application is for the real time monitoring and enforcement. Okay, of the vehicle speed, uh, of the hour of work. Okay, um, that th those are like the main purpose in the first few periods. But later on, I think what, what we learned is that once we have this data in place, once we have this system in place, uh, then we start to be able to develop another type of like online uh, management or online monitoring purpose. Like for example, uh, the bus quality standard, uh, whether the bus actually on the designated route with the uh, you know, uh, level of service that they're supposed to comply. So those, those are like the, the basic, part in this system already, uh, starting from the same implementation of, of, of 
of the data collection, data acquisition process. And then later on, is we, we, we realized not only us as a leading team in, in terms of this, of this implementation, um, other member in, in transportation research and also the startup society in, in mobility area in Thailand start to realize that this, you know, this, this become like probably the first big data source for transport safety and planning analytics. And then a lot of application has since then been you know, applied to this data set. Like, you know, now we have the bus application for the real time uh, location of the bus in different city. We have the traffic info analytics based on this data set. Okay. So those are like, uh, you know, to make a long story to be very short in terms of the progression from uh, original purpose into building this, uh, what I try to uh, present it earlier as a cyber physical interaction of the data. And then the, 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 the system uh, have a very basic concept. Uh, my apologies for some of this uh, Thai language, but there are some English over there, I think. So again, uh, this is back in 2017. So communication standard there is still 3G, but it does, it's not like the main issue here. Now, if the new device on board is a 5G, then it's 5G communication protocol. So on board, there are both like a GPS device and also the driver identification devices that the driver ID have to be swiped through this magnet magnetic reader to identify him or herself as the driver of that vehicle. And then the data will be uh, transmitted in terms of their location, the speed, everything, like a typical GPS data that we, we, we know. But it's sent to both the fleet management system of the owner of this fleet, okay, for their own fleet management system. Uh, but at the same time, there's a national requirement that the data have also to be sent back to this uh, GPS data center that the that, uh, Department of Land Transport, DLT, uh, that's what that's what stands for, uh, operate, implement and operate this uh, data center at the moment. And this uh, data will be utilized for safety purpose for long-term planning analytics and you know, real-time uh, enforcement, also in terms of the enforcement that send the speed ticket and everything to, to the owner of the truck and to transit vehicle uh, back in, in their company. So these, these are like uh, the, the basic concept. And, and in this architecture, um, I think um, the concept is, is like, we, we're gonna have this type of data uh, that um, will be, so the GPS data is what we call the real time data over here. And this type of data is, is like you typically have to be very fast, you know, a lot of volume and need to be analyzed very quickly because what, what happened when we analyze this system is that they are both requirement for the online analytics and offline planning, okay? Uh, when we see this problem, uh, we, are, we realize that something that need to process online quickly, we cannot put so much detail on it. Right, so because time is the issue here. So in that case, we, we have a different set of um, basically the, the database technology over here to handle this more like a real time analysis and uh, real time analytics. Okay, something that have to be done quickly, like over speed, uh, over time, everything like that. So this is like on the online uh, analysis. And on the other hand, the data from the vehicle movement alone uh, is not enough for long-term or for a more detailed analysis of the behavior of that vehicle. Because then we don't know the identification of that vehicle itself. Uh, the data will not tell us the history of that vehicle, will not tell us the history of that driver, okay? Even it doesn't have that you know, level of detail about uh, which route is going. So it's purely just latitude, longitude route and the speed. But that's enough for the real-time analytics and planning. But for the offline or long-term planning, uh, we need another part, another modules to build up uh, related data based on those vehicle data. Like we need to match what, who are the driver, uh, which route is actually go along, uh, what are the type of you know, um, license that they receive in terms of the vehicle operation, so forth and so on. And, and for this uh, architecture then, I think what happened in the system is that um, the data after matching up with more detail uh, 
additional data of that vehicle, then we can utilize that in the, a lot of analysis, like behavior analysis, anomaly detect detection, and then build up this different visualization and um, application on the top of this. So I think this is, this is where we, we realize the practicality of, of these architectures that one source, one source of data that come on the real-time basis, but on one hand, we can use for the real-time operation and monitoring. But at the same time, once we have time, we have a little bit more time to match the data with other uh, detailed uh, characteristic of those data, then we can do some more detailed analytics later on, okay? So this is the current system right now. And uh, I'm showing here is about half million vehicles that are on the system right now. And uh, this one, I captured the screen like last night. So like last night, about 356,000 vehicles is on the move, okay? So some of vehicle is on the stationary. And uh, there's some detailed analytics that's going on, for example, like at this moment is about, you know, 2,600 vehicles is over speed. And then there's an operation that's gonna, you know, give them the warning, uh, send them the ticket later on or whatever in terms of the government operation in that part. And uh, over, over work uh, along the route, okay, it's 51,000 of them of the vehicle that need to take care of in this case. And the level of detail of data is, is, is kept on, on the back end system. Like, you know, this is, for example, uh, the, the historical data of the movement of these vehicles. And uh, the red dot means they are over speed. The blue dot means, you know, they're just like under the regulation of the speed. And of course, each of the data points have the detail on the map mapping onto the vehicle highway. Okay. And also in terms of the, the driver, who is the driver or this. So, this is like a standard deployment of this type of system. And um, alone in, in Bangkok, for example, I think uh, here's example that I just captured this morning, all the vehicle that running within this system in Bangkok. So you can, you can start to see immediately that, you know, once you have this, this type of implementation, this type of uh, collection of data, I think we all can start to think about like some interesting thing that we, we can analyze and get into the, the, the detail of this. Okay, what, what two or three things that we immediately have to uh, carry out with this system uh, back in 2017, 18 is that uh, first we, we, we need to apply this uh, data set to the main purpose of, of this uh, system, which is for the road safety. So this is a statistic of the accident, okay, back in 2008 uh, of the different type of vehicles the bus accident and the severity of the accident that happened. And, and I think at that time, as I said, that there's a serious concern about the number of accidents, but we try to illustrate that once the GPS device is, is installed, then immediately, of course, the speed profile and the speed violation decrease significantly, okay, over the time. And um, when we look at the, distribution of the bus speed, okay, and also the, the, the key location of the bus accident uh, during those uh, implementation, first period of the implementation, then we can, be, uh, we can observe the significant reduction in terms of the speed violation, okay? So, you know, like when you have about average of the speed violation in Thailand is about, uh, the speed limit in Thailand is actually 90. Okay, 90 kilometer per hour. We are using kilometer per hour in Thailand. And it, 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 it reduced from the over speed limit from about 107 in average, okay, of the overall country to about 95 kilometers per hour. And the number of illegal vehicles in terms of the violation uh, decreased about 30 to 40% uh, significantly. So of course, that's not like the magic Thing, anything because you put the control, then you get the reaction in terms of the driving behavior. And what we also observe is that once we get this data, we can start to analyze, uh, you know, more detail of the causal relationship of the different speed profile, different things from this group of vehicles and the uh, uh, accident frequency and fatal accident that happened to this group of vehicles. Okay, and and um, you know we also observe the you know, high level of correlation in terms of reduction of the speed and also in terms of the reduction of the severity of the accident and the frequency of the accident as well in, in this uh, statistical analysis of, of, of the data. 
And um, what we normally observe is that like in, the, in Thailand, we have this uh, long holiday. And then um, I think some of you may see the news somewhere. But during this long holiday, like a New Year holiday uh, or the Thai New Year holiday, the number of accidents increased like tenfold. Okay, it's, it's like a national battle, basically. We are talking about, you know, almost five, 600 people uh, uh, die dead due to the accident during the period of, you know, like about three to four days. And uh, quite a lot of that uh, this due to the public transit vehicle and all this uh, situation that we have. And um, what we observe is that now we, we once we implement this uh, national uh, speed control, um, this is the speed violation uh, by different region of Thailand. Okay, and you can see this uh, percentage of speed limit violation. Okay, and also we look at the control by different uh, by different road. Okay, and then after the implementation during the New Year holiday to the Songkran holiday, and percentage of the speed limit violation, uh, for example, from uh, twelve percent is reduced to like just nine percent over here in Bangkok alone. And in some of the major corridor uh, outward from the central area of Thailand to different part of the country, it's also reduced significantly in terms of speed limit violation. Okay, and, and that's also the same thing that we observe from the reduction of the speed limit violation on the national highway as well. From route, the key route to the eastern part of Thailand is highway number seven here. Uh, from this group of vehicle, more than almost 20% of the vehicle, you know, go over the speed limit. And, uh, but after the implementation, of course, number seven highway just become like 10% in terms of the speed limit violation. Okay, so I think that's, that's something that, um, what I'm trying to, it's not, it's not like um, very complicated science and anything, but it, it showed a result from the national scale point of view with this uh, type of IoT architecture of how you get the data from vehicle and you control, you apply, you analyze, and you give them the feedback immediately. And now, what 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 we what we do with the data? So, what what I got the message at that time is that okay, now it's okay. Now we got this main purpose done, and the, the process is now keep going and operation keep going at the moment. So now we suddenly end up with this big large set of data. And then we start to realize that, hey, this is also a very rich source of, uh, you know, um, data that we can utilize for our transportation and logistics planning. And then, then, then we get into the detail on how to analyze those, you know, rich data set. I'm, I'm talking about half million vehicles that we got the data every minute, okay, every minute in that level of detail. So we figure out that, um, for example, in this case, what, I'm, what I presented to, to, to you early on is that, we need to do, carry out some data process to prepare them uh, for our analytics. For instance, um, the GPS data is a continuous moving data, okay? Uh, imagine you have half million vehicles keep moving, you know, they may just start their engine and drive to the gas station and stop, and then drive to the warehouse, pick up some, uh, you know, goods and then deliver, you know, whatever. And then maybe another vehicle go just go to the maintenance garage and then stay there for like three hours. So there's a, lot, a wide range of the noise and a wide range of the, 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 the thing that we don't know what actually represent in those uh, vehicle movements. So what we, what we did is that we, we basically implement uh, the data uh, cleaning uh, about the, um, in terms of the cutting out or sorting out the key elements of movement, okay? Because within this uh, long set of trajectory data, there will be, uh, like I say, we don't know what, what's the, whether it's a genuine purpose of movement. The concept of our transport planning is like origin to destination, for example. But in the real vehicle movement that the data coming in continuously, we cannot define what is origin and what is the destination. So in this case, we need to really create this system by, by itself, by looking at uh, you know, the time interval of the activity, what, what I call, I, frame the term called mini OD, and then just chop it off to different segments first, okay, by using some, you know, like a speed limit, uh, speed criteria, speed control, and the time of activity, so forth and so on. And then, and then start to make, pot, make sort of like a vehicle state. Um, so linking on this, like a different leg of vehicle, and then try to fit 
fit them into uh, this like a weaker state of movement. So like a weaker moving, stop, move again. So when I say stop, it doesn't mean like the vehicle have the speed of zero kilometer per hour, just for like, you know, 10, you know, five minutes, that's called vehicle stop. No, uh, the state mean that they're actually in the state of using the vehicle for some purpose. Okay, so, so stop mean really they have, have a uh, stop purpose. And, um, and then when we implement this on the real time basis, I think uh, what, what happened is that you need to think of the way to analyze the data. And then at the same time, you get the new data set immediately. Because if we only think about the long-term analytics, then we, you have the data set of uh, let's say half million vehicle at hand, and everything finished within that time frame is okay. But what, what I just presented to you is a, is a, is a real-time feeding data system that as we analyze the data, the new data keep coming in, okay? So there's a way that we need to look at the, the way to analyze the data as the new data coming in, okay? So, you know, how to actually uh, put the new data into this uh, state analysis, so forth and so on, okay? And once you get this uh, mini state of, of the vehicle movement, then we start to map them with the location data, okay? So we start to understand that uh, some particular location is uh, vehicle cargo, some of them is some different activity data. Then we can start to make some sense of whether that's actually the genuine origin and destination of the, the definition of trip that we have in our traditional transport planning, okay? And um, some of the filtering out of the noise that some location is, is just temporarily stopped. It's not the real vehicle stop, for example. And then, so when the thought out, then I think uh, what we did is we implement this into the, the data analytics and then this keep processing this, you know, movement of vehicle data. And we have like a long, you know, what we call the vehicle chain and also the sub origin destination of all the vehicle involved in, in this network. And, and that's now become the main database for the freight movement and all the analytics involved for the national highway planning in, in Thailand at the moment. So uh, basically we, we have almost 100% penetration rate of the observation in terms of the, this group of vehicle movement. And uh, then I think we are happy at that time. And then suddenly we got the request from another department. I think this is one example, once you start to, keep, uh, you know, to, to roll this into the eye of policy maker and also to this like transport planner, then they realize that, hey, how about you know, we want to see more detail of activity of the commodity movement. Uh, then we got a question on, now we know that there's a lot of vehicle move from A to B, from B to C, but you know, what type of commodity that they carry? So one thing I would like to mention is that from the GPS set of data of the truck, we don't have, you know, we don't have any type of information about the commodity that they carry, okay? Um, so what, what, what we did is, I think this, 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 this are uh, the work that we publish uh, in transportation research uh, part E. Okay, and um, I think uh, what we try to do is that we look at the way to apply further analytics onto uh, the same data set to analyze uh, what type of commodity that those trucks carry. Okay, with with you know without really having to. Uh, request for additional data from the driver or from the company owner of the vehicles. And uh, we apply like uh, basically the way to analyze it, we, we use um, the location data of the vehicles. Uh, we fit in with, um, sorry, I'm just going through this very, very quickly. For example, like in this case, uh, we look at different commodity types and we have different patterns of uh, what we call the activity location and act activity chain for these freight vehicles. So if they carry the rice, then, you know, there's like 14 different patterns that, that you know, exhibit in, in the data. And um, they come from the rice mill and then they go to the warehouse, they go to the port for the export or they go to, you know, like a rice packaging factory in the middle, so forth and so on. So what happened is that we, basically look into a different commodity to figure out this different uh, with what we call trip chain pattern for different uh, commodity. And then we apply that in, into the analytics of all the data sets that we have the vehicle movement and we infer, of course, it's not 100% correct in this case because uh, those who ask for the data, they don't need 100%, they want just a 
key trajectory chain of the data, okay? So we apply that into the analytics and then uh, we, we can see the, uh, the movement, for example, in Thailand, the vehicle that carry the alcoholic beverage, okay? Uh, what are the key location of the distribution and the volume of movement to, to different area. And um, apart from that, uh, some agricultural product is like the, the rice uh, in this case, uh, we see the community flow of the rice meal and later on it become quite an interesting way to measure uh, what we call the economic activity to different areas. Okay. And some of the key location, once we figure out uh, the community of the vehicle, then uh, we can figure out the key activity of those related uh, commodity industry in, in, in the region. So that directly go back to, to, the, to the land use planning and other things that, that I, I, I think we all know how important it is for the national planning. Okay. Uh, here example of the uh, sugar, okay, for the sugar as a community from the sugar cane field in sub-region and then uh, come to some uh, sugar mill hub and distribute all over the distribution network in this case. And uh, paper mill, okay, and uh, oil depots so forth and so on, okay? And um, the same set of data that I just explained also being directly utilized to look at the road informatics. So what happened is that from the real-time movement data uh, with some further uh, development, then it's used to observe the utilization of the highway, also the quality of service of the highway in terms of speed. Of course, this is similar to the Google map and everything. Maybe you know, some may think that oh, it's already available, but the difference is that we have more like continuous uh, stream of data and we can look at the more detail of the temporal trend of the speed and also of the uh, different turning movement in terms of the vehicle uh, delay, okay? And that's already been used as a central data component for the uh, National Smart Highway Network system that, that, that I, I, I mentioned earlier, and now it's, it's, it's a central data part that instead of having to install different sensors across the highway, so from the same uh, data system that originated for the safety or control purpose, then now it become available and uh, further utilized for the highway management purpose at, at, at the moment. So this become like the, 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 the key data to help you to decide some of the key traffic management into, in, in the national intercity route in Thailand. Okay. So from, from that part, I think um, what I just explained is that then everyone is, 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 you know, is quite excited about, about how the data that suddenly become available. So it's like suddenly you, you discover the, the, the gold mine and then you start to do a lot of things. And then uh, later on, we got the request that, hey, but those are the data that basically uh, look at the uh, fleet movement, uh, vehicle truck movement, even some transit movement that I, I didn't mention what we did in the detail. Uh, but then there is another big part that we haven't done, which is on the, on the uh, sort of like a general public movement or the, the typical private uh, traveler, okay? So we got a request to, to look at into this as well. And then the only way that we propose and implement for them is that uh, we now suggest that uh, you have to be able to retrieve the data from the mobile phone operator. And uh, in Thailand, there are three uh, major mobile phone operators and uh, you know, about two of the operator agree to, to get into this system. And what, 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 what happened is that the push for this is that in, as you know, in all transport planning and forecasting uh, is, is actually designed and implemented to avoid uh, uh, investment decision that is not worthwhile. For, for example, when we decide, we decide to build the new uh, transit network and everything, you don't want the case that, you know, uh, you invest a 10 or 10 or million uh, dollars or like a billion baht, and then suddenly you realize that there's no demand for it, okay? Because what you use as a planning tool is not, you know, it's not like the review, the real behavior of the, of the user. So in this case, we, 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 we basically, acquire uh, and implement the system that we receive the mobile phone data, um, not the GPS or GNSS location inside the mobile phone, but the base station of, of the mobile devices. And I think uh, everyone probably can 
know or understand how, how it works because the mobile phone device have to relate themselves, which is themselves to the nearest base station uh, to, to, to basically receive the call and answer the call, basically. So those are the data that have the, 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 the footprint in, in the mobile operator network. And then when, when we work with, with the mobile operator team, uh, what we realize is that um, you know in our head in in our model is okay that's straightforward we're gonna see that you know even there is not detailed location movement but we probably we see the spatial movement in the radius about fifty to hundred meter across the city okay so that's gonna be straightforward but what happened is that I think most of the operator we only keep the first they only keep the base station coordinate and second for the data privacy purpose okay. Uh, they don't keep the exact time, okay, of the data. So they only keep the like uh, what what we call like a quarter period of the time. For example, this data appear in this zone between uh, nine o'clock in the morning until um, uh, nine fifteen, for example. And 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 that 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 become the challenge on on op we have some data. For example, in this case, you can see there's a. Uh, you know, like uh, date and time and location and everything, but latitude, longitude here is not the exact latitude, longitude of the mobile phone, but it's of the base station coordinate. And the time that we got is not the actual time of the data, but it's the approximate interval of time in the period of 15 minutes, okay? So to get rid of this problem in this particular context, we, on one hand, we feel it's okay. Then we we avoid uh, the the question on the you know in terms of data privacy everything. But on the other hand, to really make use of these data, we need to do a lot of data cleansing, data aggregation, like I, I mentioned previously. And uh, one other thing is that we need to be able to sort out the movement that make logical sense. Okay, so like you have a sequence of the data that you know may not really form a type of uh, activity movement or special movement of the a person, but then you need to be able to sort them out, you know, like to fit in some particular pattern of, of daily life. And, and that's one of the first challenge that we, we tackle in this case. Uh, secondly, at the same time, you need to carry out what we call the actual time estimate uh, based on the sequence of the, this data point that, that, that we extract and we sort of like to order them again. And then we need to really estimate what actually what was likely the time point Okay, time data of that data point. And, and once we carry, carried it out, then uh, on top of that, what, what, what we did is that we infer what are the modes of those traveler and what are the activities involved in that particular uh, data set. Okay, and um, so it's a, what, what, what we did is that, of course, is we are back to the drawing board, like what we normally do in travel behavior analytics is that there is a time element, there is a location element, there is a sequence element, and then we go into the, the, the data survey to cre create a sort of like a training data set that you know, typically in this area, what are the, the sequence of the behavior and the time spent. And then of course we build up this like likelihood model and then fit in the data into this likelihood model. And for example, like in this case here, if the sequence is you know, going on to a different combination of area, which, uh, you know, with the time uh, discrepancy that likely to relate themselves to use of the transit station. And, you know, and particularly in that transit area, then it's likely to be the work trip, so on and so on. Then, you know, we assign higher probability to those uh, data sets. And then that become the result of, of one set of data analytics. And then, and, and, and what happened in this system is that once you apply this data, then you've got the rich detail of different uh, activity movement of, of the population. The system is implemented for the greater area of Bangkok uh, with the data of, you know, almost like about three, four million mobile data movement. And I think um, uh, now we, we continually uh, be able to infer, okay, the mode of, of of each activity of each trip and also the activity inference of the purpose and the location related in terms of that activity from those mobile phone data. Uh, some example of this is like, you know, you know, now they use for this distribution of population activity in the area, you know, they, 
we figure out this uh, average, this standard average time of different activities of travel, uh, different time of day, day of week, and you know the key location of this. Of course, the OD is there, and the OD we apply the same co same concept of this mini OD analysis that I explained earlier. And some more detail of the direct, uh, in terms of the direct uh, statistic of you know uh, proportion of uh, mode usage by time of day, um, you know different average travel 